Oh, yes, indeed. Much better. How's my hair looking? Actually, it's... No, it's it's been better. Okay. Testing, testing, testing. Wonderful. Okay. Um, Yeah, so usually when I make a production, I usually make a really flashy intro. Uh, As you've probably gathered, you're not getting one this time. But it's not because I'm lazy. It's because um, I think this is quite a serious production, actually. I mean, I guess you could say every production I make is serious, right? But uh, this one especially. Because usually when I make a production, I make them so that... Every single person, no matter who you are, could press it and they'd walk away having learned something. But the problem with this one is that this isn't really for everyone, to be completely honest with you. So, if I had to split the population up into a a different type of group, I would say about 80% of the population are what, what I would call pragmatic. And so, they see the world for how it is. And these people, are all, they always tend to be quite useful, right? A pragmatic person is never useless. But they tend to stick in their own lane. They don't like to experiment or rock the boat too much. But then you have like 20% of people who are quite idealistic. And these are the people who see the world for how it should be, how they want it to be. I would say I fit into this category. But the problem with idealistic people is that they can actually... Um, Depending on what ideology they latch on to, they can either do really well or really badly. So that they'll either be like a, like a hero or a villain. Never in between. It's always an extreme of, the, of, of, of one of the two. And this production really is for the idealists. It's for the people like myself. Because I know for most people who watch this, what I'm about to say will be considered almost obvious. Like, duh. But for the idealists, it won't be obvious. In fact, to the idealists, what I'm about to say could be a potentially life-changing revelation for them. And I don't say that dramatically, I really mean it. Because I think that if people realised this, idealistic people who are me- uh, who who are well meaning i think the world would be a so much better place and so if you're a pragmatist you know you're you're someone who sees the world for how it is you're quite grounded you know, go and watch some fortnite or something like that it would probably uh you know you probably enjoy it more but if you're an idealist you feel very uneasy about the world you want to try and fix it, and you're, you're, you're curious, like, what the hell is going on? Kind of like myself. Um, well, stay tuned. You know, this might, uh, might do something for you. This production is about two eyes, institutions and influences. Let me ask you a question. What makes a country a country? Is it the flag? The anthem, the borders, the people, the leader? No. What makes a country a country is its institutions. Imagine one of those Roman Greek style buildings, a roof held up by some pillars. Think of the roof as the country and the pillars as its institutions. If one pillar collapses, the roof will start to wobble. But if too many pillars collapse, the entire structure will come crashing down. There are six institutions. Culture, economics, education, law, media, and health. Each one equally as important as the others. And the hexagon is truly the perfect shape to represent such, because it is six-sided, with equally even sides. Precisely as the institutions are. When civilizations thrive, it's often because their institutions are healthy. Their culture is moral, their economy is booming, their education is prosperous, their laws are fair, their media is pure, and their health is good. 
But when civilizations wither, it's often because their institutions are corrupt. Their culture is immoral, their economy is dying, their education is terrible, their laws are unfair, their media is disgraceful, and their health is garbage. But what exactly is it that determines whether such institutions are healthy or unhealthy? Well, that would be determined by its influences. Wealth, power, and fame. These three make up what I like to call the trinity of influence. Wealth, of course, meaning how much money, assets, and resources you have. Your portfolio of the material that can be valued numerically and traded as per appropriate. Power, meaning how much your opinions can be translated into law, your ability to influence people on a mass scale via the threat of brute force. And fame, being how recognised and renowned you are, with the bonus of being able to bring attention to whoever or whatever you so please, with maximum effectiveness. All three of these desires within the Trinity are crucial to the human experience, and living without them can prove very costly indeed. Craving no wealth is bad, because it can lead you into poverty, and potentially even death. Craving no power is bad, because it can lead you into obeying others forever, with no individual autonomy. And craving no fame is bad, because it can lead you to become disconnected from society, and living like an alien as a result. But of course, such desires can also be taken to an illogical extreme. Craving too much wealth is bad, because it can make you greedy, living an empty life of meaningless luxury. Craving too much power is bad, because it can turn you into a tyrant, oppressing those different to you. And craving too much fame is bad, because it can lead you into desperation, doing literally anything just to get attention. In reality, most people often find themselves somewhere in the middle. Craving some wealth, to be able to have the basics to survive, as well as the odd luxury. Craving some power, to be able to live their life how they so please, without the fear of oppression. And craving some fame, to feel appreciated by their friends, family, and wider community at large, like the tribal species we inherently are, and always have been. Again, all three of these desires within the Trinity are crucial to the human experience. However, it's not like each one lives in perpetual isolation. On the contrary, wealth, power, and fame actively piggyback off each other. If you have wealth, you also probably have some level of power and fame, as it would be pretty hard to be a billionaire who has no links to powerful people, with nobody knowing your name. If you have power, you also probably have some level of wealth and fame, as it would be pretty hard to be a world leader, with no money, who no one even knows. And if you have fame, you probably also have some level of wealth and power, as it would be pretty hard to be a world-famous celebrity who's broke and having no influence. But while all three of these somehow back each other up, depending on what kind of society you're living in, one of them is always in the driving seat, meaning that the other two always answer to it. So let's start off by looking at a society that has fame in the driving seat. An example of a society that puts fame in the driving seat would be a theocracy, such as, say, Saudi Arabia and the Vatican. Saudi Arabia is the jewel of the Islamic world, the home of the holy city of Mecca, of which millions of Muslims worldwide perform a pilgrimage therein every year. The flag of the nation is literally just text that says, There is no God but Allah. The Vatican, on the other hand, is an independent nation created purely so the Catholic Church can have their own sovereign holy dominion, of which the Pope has jurisdiction and authority. In both of these places, fame is in the driving seat, but not the fame of celebrities, but the fame of their holy scriptures. The millennia-old tales of the Abrahamic prophets are held in absolute glory, and cannot simply be overruled or sold away. Take power, for example. If the King of Saudi Arabia or the Pope of the Vatican hypothetically came out and said that they were atheist, despised their religions, and wanted to implement laws that completely went against such faiths, they'd both be taken out of power within 24 hours. Because the King of Saudi Arabia isn't really the leader of Saudi Arabia. Allah is. And the Pope of the Vatican isn't really the leader of the Vatican. God is. For in such theocracies, the official head of state is merely meant to be a human pawn of the divine. For the power humans hold within these states is merely meant to be symbolic. And likewise, when it comes to wealth, the same logic also applies. 
It doesn't matter if you're a billionaire in Saudi Arabia. If you want alcohol, you aren't getting it. And if you're a billionaire in the Vatican and want a prostitute, again, you aren't getting it. Well, at least on paper, anyway. Now, admittedly, these are both pretty bad examples, because both the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and Vatican City have been slowly crumbling their faiths away in recent years, but nevertheless, you get the point. In a theocracy, wealth and power is always meant to come secondary to the fame of the religions of which such nations are based upon. For here, fame is in the driving seat. Pretty interesting, but what of a society that has power in the driving seat? Well, for that, we only need to look at dictatorships such as nations like China and North Korea. In China, the Chinese government, operated by the Chinese Communist Party, is the source of ultimate authority. And in North Korea, the Kim family has ruled for generations with an absolute iron fist. Both of these countries have totalitarian regimes that rule over every aspect of their citizens' lives without remorse and the centralised power of such governments has no tolerated competition of any kind. Take wealth, for example. Jack Ma, the co-founder of Alibaba Group, is one of China's wealthiest men, with an estimated net worth of over $35 billion. You'd think, then, that Jack would have significant sway over the Chinese state's affairs, but this would be a very wrong assumption indeed. One day, Jack did a speech whereby he openly criticised China's banks and regulators. Not too long later, those same regulators underwent a regulatory crackdown on his businesses, and Jack even went on to disappear from the public eye for months. When he returned, he was, needless to say, far less outspoken. As The Guardian put it, he might have been worth more than £35 billion, but it swiftly became clear who was boss. In China, it doesn't matter how wealthy you are. To openly criticise or embarrass the government is always a very unwise move, regardless of the size of your bank account. Your wealth isn't going to get you very far by itself, and it's illegal to even take it out of the country. And don't even think about trying to bribe any politicians with it, unless you want a one-way ticket to execution for both them and you. And China, in comparison to North Korea, is considered to be incredibly economically laid back, whereby even just the idea of a businessman in North Korea existing independently to the state is considered almost laughable. And this same logic also applies to fame. It doesn't matter what your religion is or how much of a famous celebrity you are in China or North Korea, for that religion is discarded, and any fame that you have can easily be taken away very quickly by the governments of such nations, who control every aspect of their societies. In these nations, you parrot the government mantra, and don't dare to challenge it, or you're off the air. Again proving the point that power is in the driving seat within such nations. And while you can certainly still become wealthy and famous within them, such will always come secondary to the power of the state. Which brings us on finally to the real main point of this production. A society that has wealth in the driving seat. Of which the best example would be, of course, the so-called democracies of the United States of America and the European Union. Historically, the Western world used to be a fame-driven society, with Christianity ruling the roost theocratically without question. Then, with the rise of numerous ideologies, it became a power-driven society, with nationalism reigning supreme. But nationalism ultimately concluded in World War II, whereby in the aftermath of such horrors, the West went back to the drawing board, of which spawned neoliberalism. The idea being that if people put their religious, national and cultural differences aside, and instead became economically interlinked, humanity could progress together, and world peace would be achieved. This was perfected culturally in the 1960s, and economically in the 1990s, whereby after the fact, the Western world became much less nationalistic, less religious, and just generally far less collectivistic at large. In the place of what came before spawned a new cosmopolitan culture that is incredibly globalistic, atheistic, and just generally far more individualistic at large. But the issue with such cosmopolitanism, however, is that in trying to relate to everyone, it ironically ended up relating to no one. And as people struggled to relate to the status quo in any meaningful way, this, in tandem, caused people to instead focus on themselves. Whereby within such an atomised culture, feelings of trust, duty and will to invest in society all started to rapidly decrease. 
As such, money, as a raw, tangible and easily tradable means of value, quickly became the only effective way to get things done, ultimately putting wealth above all else in the driving seat. Take power, for example. In the West today, it doesn't really matter how much of a passionate politician you are, for it's almost guaranteed that the vast majority of your peers probably won't be. For wealthy businessmen are simply allowed to donate to politicians with relative ease, and without such donations, they'd never actually be able to get anywhere. As a result, publicly, the politicians will of course repeat the mantras of what their voters want to hear. But when they actually get elected into power, they simply do what their donors desire, essentially turning them into an unofficial puppet of their interests. And this logic is true for both left-wing and right-wing politicians, respectively. Think of how many left-wing politicians promise things like a better healthcare system, only to go on and sell it off to private corporations. Or how many right-wing politicians promise things like reducing immigration, only to go on and keep their borders flooded with cheap labour. Such politicians will always be shameless sellouts, as external wealth now dominates the illusionary power apparatuses that pretend to claim authority. In the West, the true leaders are no longer the presidents or prime ministers, but the wealthy who control their actions. The exact opposite logic of nations like China. And this likewise also poses true with fame. As religion has perished from the mainstream, people now put their faith in other people. But while it is of course still possible to become well-known without selling one's soul, you would nevertheless be competing against people backed by billions of dollars worth of international capital. As seen by the fact that most famous people in the Western world no longer spawn from talent or even being decent people, but either via nepotism or because they're willing to be an empty vessel of bourgeoisie interests. The most blatant example of this being the so-called comedy shows that litter the airwaves, of which no one finds even mildly amusing, yet somehow still draws in an artificially high audience. But it's not just them. The movies, the games, the music, the fashion, the influencers are almost all but selected puppets, just like the politicians. Creating a blatantly artificial stinker of a status quo media culture, that barely anyone but the most insufferable of socialites actually approves of. In the Western world, it's clear that cash is king. And it seems you agree. I did a poll on Twitter where I asked you all, which one of these trinity of desires is the most important to you? Wealth won by a massive majority of 62%. Power coming in second at 37% with fame barely scraping by with a staggeringly low 1%. Clearly then, this dominance that wealth has in the West is subconsciously understood by many. Remember earlier when I said that there are pragmatic people who see the world for how it is? These are the people who picked wealth. But you may also remember when I said that there is a smaller group who are idealistic, who see the world for how they want it to be. And these people likely picked the other options, and to these, such a revelation may be quite a sobering reality check. I think of all the people, on the left and right, who are political activists. Dedicated socialists with their theories and mantras. Religious preachers with their fiery passions of faith. These people are all, at their core, good people, with good intents. But regardless of that, however, in a wealth-driven society, their messages will ultimately fall on deaf ears. Take my conduct, for example. It's like, okay, I make these productions, and what is my aim with them? Well, they're essentially sociological analyses, where I identify problems and attempt to conjure solutions to them. So my ultimate aim with them is to spread such messages far and wide. But I think to myself, well, hang on a minute. If I was a millionaire, I could just pay a bunch of streamers a small fortune to livestream themselves reacting to a bunch of my productions, and as such, the reach of them would be increased, regardless of whether or not they were positively or negatively received. Or, even better, if one really was wealthy, couldn't I just hire people to create media with a similar messaging, essentially just like the neoliberal establishment do? Which makes me think, well, but why do I even make these? Which brings us back to the institutions. If institutions in the Western world are ultimately influenced by wealth, then surely it would be logical to prioritise earning wealth first, because from such will come everything else. And... Yeah. Take Donald Trump, for example. 
He didn't just become the President of the United States by accident. He first became wealthy, then used his wealth to get famous, then used his fame to get power. And doing such in that order is really the most ideal way to influence the Western world, even if it isn't right. Don't believe me? Then let's do what I like to call the pink tutu test. Let's say I wanted you to frolic around your local town square wearing a pink tutu for an hour. Now, obviously, you don't want to do that. Probably. But what would be the most effective way for me to convince you to do that? Perhaps you could be threatened by power. You will frolic in the pink tutu, or else! But that would probably just make you want to do it less out of spite. Threats aren't exactly an ideal motivator. Perhaps you could be lured with the promise of fame. Dude, if you frolic in the tutu, people will think you're so hilarious and you'll get a ton of views! But does anyone really want to be known as the guy who wears a pink tutu and frolics around their town square? Probably not. But what if I said to you, frolic in the tutu and I'll give you a thousand dollars? Well now that tickles the spot. You would instantly start to make the mathematical calculation in your head of whether it would be worth it or not. And while not everyone would say yes, I guarantee there would be some who would. And this really says everything, doesn't it? The problem with most pragmatic people is that while they are grounded in reality, they also tend to always play it safe. Idealistic people, however, are the ones who rock the boat, but without such proper guidance, their destination will prove fruitless. And I think where a lot of idealistic people go wrong, myself included, is that we focus so much on how things should be that we forget to work with how things actually are. There's factually never been a wealth-driven neoliberal society at any other point in human history. And similar to how humanity had to learn its lesson from other failed ideologies in the past, it seems so too must we with this today. But if such a doomsday is truly inevitable, then rather than just waiting for it, surely it's wise to pragmatically accept this reality, even if potentially temporal, and work with it instead. As the issue we faced in recent decades is that the only people doing this are those with a psychopathic affinity towards such greed in the first place. Hence why our institutions are in such a corrupt, foul state. We all know about military warfare. We all know about information warfare. But financial warfare is something that barely anyone has on their agenda. And yet, in a wealth-driven society, is by far the most important. I did another poll where I asked people, do you currently own shares in any publicly traded company? Just 18% of people said yes, with a staggering 82% saying no. How is it that in a wealth-driven society, where there is billions of dollars worth of stocks in circulation, the overwhelming majority of people are fine with not owning a cent? This is a perception that simply has to change. Business doesn't have to be a douchebag's domain. Idealistic people should use their creativity to garner as much wealth as possible to wield as influence. As from such influence, one could use such to steer society, anonymously or otherwise, to a better destination. A moralistic culture, charitable economics, state-of-the-art education, lobbying for fairer laws, truthful media, and good health. Some would say that this is akin to fighting fire with fire, but I disagree. If the lessons of neoliberalism's failures are inevitable, then using its own logic against it to hasten its demise can surely only be a positive. It isn't about becoming neoliberal, but using it against those who preach it. Divorcing your mental state from being determined by the health of your nation or the popularity of your religion, but instead the drive of your own corporation. For let's face it, without such, your nation and religion have no power or fame regardless. So I say, get your business hat on, slam those stocks, and support only enterprises you approve of. For again, cash, whether you like it or not, is king. So don't be a servant.